Hello, everyone. My name is Siddharth Desai. And I'm uh, Rishi Bhamar. We are so pleased to conduct a masterclass session on location and location intelligence at Your Story Text Parks 2020. In today's session, we'll help cover and deliver the insights on the generational shift in location technologies, covering the history, geography, and physics of location technologies, the various application domains where location is playing a role presently, and location data can play a huge role and the importance of location data in 2020 and what it means for the future. As early as uh, 10,000 BC, uh, location started with American Indians to ancient Chinese using smoke signals to locate home as well as communicate messages. And then going back uh, to 5,000 years ago, seafaring explorers would use mathematics to uh, determine the coordinates by measuring the angle of sun and other stars. But sometime around 800 years ago was the first time someone thought of using a technological contraption, a magnetic compass, which helped navigators determine their direction as well as latitude. Hard as it is to believe it took us 600 more years to figure out a way to measure longitude. And then we started another invention called a chronometer in the 18th century to track the time change between home and the current location. Pretty soon we picked up pace like nothing else and within 200 years and partly because of World War II, we started using strengths of radio signals to estimate our coordinates from long distances. This phenomenon was uh, made possible because of this German fellow Heinrich Hertz and the device for measuring it is still used in modern day jet fighters, missile systems, submarines, as well as a self-driving car, which is called a radar. But it was in the 1960s, uh, catapulted because of the Cold War, which set the wheels in motion for the most sophisticated location apparatus ever, uh, the satellite. What first started as you know, a group of six satellites orbiting the poles to track US submarines using the Doppler effect, evolved into a constellation of 24 satellites fully operationalized by 1993. Presently, it is at about 33 satellites, all owned by US government and operated by US Air Force, and now most recently, uh, the newly built US Space Force. Now, there are two categories of U uh, GPS, a less accurate system known as SPS, which provides a five meters accuracy, which is freely available to the entire world. But there's another category called PPS, which provides up to 30 centimeters accuracy, which is only selectively available to US law uh, and armed forces. This is why Russia had its own GLONASS positioning system built concurrently with the US GPS, while China has its own constellation of 35 satellites with a global coverage called Beidou. Now, a sad reminder of this huge dependency on American GPS was realized when USA denied the use of GPS to India during the Kargil War, when it needed the most. Every country which aims to becoming a superpower must have its own satellite system. And that is why India, as recently as 2016, launched its own positioning system called NAVIC, with seven satellites covering India and the surrounding region. The 1990s also saw the initial introduction of mobile telephony and therefore cellular triangulation to track location. Now, with cell towers now being ubiquitous everywhere, cellular triangulation is still used by law enforcement agencies as well as transportation companies to track their truck fleet via feature phones. Apart from adoption of barcode and RFID as mobile point scanning technologies, which could be indirectly used for location mapping, every supply chain which is organized today uses either of the two for in, uh, inventory tagging. But it was a smartphone revolution of in early 2000s, which blew the location economy wide open with technologies invented and spectrum discovered even decades back started seeing adoption after the introduction of smartphones. Wi-Fi based positioning using standard RSSI techniques started in late 2000s and is still very much a norm. BLE or Bluetooth low energy was the blue eyed child of Apple and Google with the introduction of iBeacon and Eddystone. It picked up rapid pace in adoption with BLE sensor prices decreasing and BLE standards updating at a faster rate. So it is sure to stay. NFC started getting adopted due to payments provisioning once Apple Pay and Samsung Pay did it. And after that, UWB started getting adopted on a huge scale for high precision tracking. 
then onwards visual positioning was given a huge fillip because of google tango which leveraged cameras on a smartphone to position the user uh, while tango didn't work out as well the concept of using cameras turned out to be a game changer and it will be used in future generations this is because of an industry we're all come, uh, we've all come to be familiar with called augmented reality and virtual reality now in today's world huge amount of research is going on in full swing to even leverage more location tracking technologies like lidar to power self driving and autonomous cars and let me provide a quick caveat this is by no means an exhaustive list every element that i just mentioned is a discipline in itself and it would probably take us hours to cover each one of them now we spoke about a few location technologies just a minute back now with each of the location technologies there are several techniques that have been developed over time for the science or the physics of location tracking with the cell of origin technique the location proximity of the receiver is calculated by simply filtering the highest value of transmitted signal strength of the transmitter which could be a cell tower a wifi ap a ble beacon or any other the rssi technique or the received signal strength indicator calculates the 1d distance based on the strength of the transmitter's signal as seen by the receiving device this is most often used by ble beacons today for distance measurement followed by trilateration techniques to calculate their location coordinates the time of arrival technique often called the time of flight as well which is also by the way used by gps is the travel time of a radio signal from a single transmitter to a remote single receiver now by the relation between light speed and vacuum and the carrier frequency of the signal time is a measure for the distance between transmitter and the receiver and this distance can then be calculated from the time of arrival as signals travel with a known velocity now the time of arrival data between two base stations will narrow a position to a position circle and then onwards the data from a third base station is required to resolve the precise position to a single point this conceptually is called trilateration which is a which is a geometric calculation and this is based on a concept we all study in school uh, three points in a plane form a unique circle and when you do this with four base stations of four transmitters you get x y as well as z coordinates and that's what we are actually doing uh, in in locate 6.0 with three dimensional tracking now with pdoa or time distance uh, time difference of arrival the tag transmits unique signals at regular intervals to all receive receiver nodes or base stations in its vicinity which must have a synchronized clock now this data is pushed to a central server and the distance is thereby calculated on the difference between arrival time on each of the base stations then onwards a trilateration or a multilateral a multilateration process ensues which can then be used to calculate location coordinates uh, pdoa is a more expensive method because you need chip level atomic clocks at each and every base station which needs to be wired as well as network connected now just like distance based or lateration techniques use arrivals of absolute and difference in time angle of arrival uses angles or direction from which the signal is received now this is usually uh, done by placing a costly 360 degree antenna array on the base station and measuring the difference in the received phase at each element in the antenna array AOA allows very high accuracy and BLE 5.1 standard which is the latest one has a provision for that Cisco hyperlocation uh, which which also promises a very high accuracy level is also based on that the other technique called fingerprinting technique uh, uses uh, location patterning or pattern matching either via decision tree or regression techniques to be able to measure location zones This technique is also used for electromagnetic positioning based on DTW or distance time walking techniques. Dead reckoning technique essentially uses inertial sensors and a, a, to be able to count the distance that is traveled and the direction in which the distance is traveled to be able to measure relative position. This is the same technique which is used in step counters in Fitbits or Apple Watch so on and so forth. Uh the other two techniques are based on video analytics or vision based positioning which are either a combination of kernel based systems or contour based systems they are again used to be able to track the object or the uh, uh, object of choice using neural network algorithms
Now, as you've probably seen, uh, we've covered the history of, of location. We've covered the physics or the science of location. Now, when it comes to the geography of location, there are two types of location geographies or environments we need to be aware of. One is the outdoor location environment, which calculates a standard geopositioning coordinate in the form of latitudes and longitudes. But there's a whole new uh, uh, environment of indoor location, which calculates location, which, is, which, which doesn't have a very standard latitude, longitude-like concept. Humans spend more than 90% of their time in indoor spaces, be it at retail stores, be it at factories, be it at offices, be it at airports. Every spatial coordinate in an indoor space is different, be it the building, the floor number, the room number, the aisle number, the shelf number, or the rack position. And this is what uniquely defines an indoor environment and compared to a geographic location of an outdoor environment. Rishi, do you want to take it? Thanks, Siddharth. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Yeah. So thanks, Siddharth. Uh, let's now start looking at um, you know, some elements of the indoor location. Let's look at uh, the indoor location from an accuracy and a precision standpoint. Um, if you start, uh, you realize that you know, at up to 100 meters accuracy, it's much easier to achieve that, um, you know, knowing if somebody is in the neighborhood. This is pretty much what uh, you know, your Uber and um, uh, you know, your uh, cell towers kind of uh, uh, you know, emit, essentially knowing the position of a person in the neighborhood. You don't need to know or you don't need to um, uh, uh, guess where that person is. You just get a point in a circle, um, uh, you know, essentially knowing up, and up to an accuracy of about 100 meters of where that person or that individual or that device essentially is. As we start moving inwards, <clears throat> what you're going to see is that as you hit the indoor aspects of the building, Wi-Fi starts to play a critical role in determining the presence of somebody inside the location. Now this could, what we call this as a presence level location, which is somebody is in the building or not in the building, or somebody is in the zone or not in the zone. You already went through some of the techniques earlier, uh, the physics or the science of the location. And what wireless does at this point in time or enables at this point in time is a location accuracy driven by RSSI and the access point density. So you position the number of access points uh, in, in such a manner that the calculation or the science behind it accurately predicts the presence of a device at, uh, you know, at anywhere between 7 to 30 meters inside of a building. And this is, of course, very, very critical from the standpoint that the device or the particular tag or the individual is kind of connected to to be associated to the wireless um, uh, access points. Um, when we go further in, right, when we want to go closer to the center of the circle, uh, you start to realize that the technology or the tech stack kind of changes a little bit and the density of the number of those uh, devices also changes a little bit. So you start to look at when, you know, when you start to look at five meters, you're now going slightly away from wireless as the default signal to looking at maybe RFID BLE based uh, tags. You know, again, it uses the same signs, but the capability of it now to five meters becomes largely possible. And here, as you see, the density of these beacons also increases. So where at any point in time earlier with a single access point, you would determine whether the person was in the building or not in the building, depending on whether he was connected or not connected, to the point where now you have three to four BLE beacons that are kind of um, you know, deployed at, at a specific um, uh, you know, square footage area to actually determine the exact location of, of that individual, of that device, to a five meter accuracy. You want to go further and further closer you start to change the technology from an RSSI to an angle of arrival, like you heard before. And you start to look at Wi-Fi BLE angle of arrival. And here, now the AP density changes. You're no longer looking at whether the person's presence is there in the building or not. You're looking at whether the person is within three meter of radius. And that is predicted to over 95 to 96% of the time, right? So these are things where 
you want to look at uh, which zone is an individual inside the building. Am I in the cafeteria or am I not in the cafeteria? Am in the cafeteria, am I near the coffee machine or I am not near the coffee machine? And with that element coming in, you need to start looking at a more denser deployment of whatever tech, tech stack that you want to use in terms of determining the location. As we go more closer to the uh, center of the circle, you have uh, UWB that has just you know, been adopted by Apple aggressively. I believe that this is, this is a tech uh, that is going to um, see a large scale adoption very soon with more and more Apple devices kind of adopting to this technology, as well as in Locate, which is kind of you know, a proprietary available technology as well. This would give you sub meter location accuracy level. Um, you could actually now interchange this um, to essentially even locate an item on a rack, right? So if I'm a retailer and I want to do a certain level of um, inventory management, inventory tracking, I get down to a point where I either use uh, inlocate or UWB to look at um, you know the level of uh, you know sub meter accuracy. Again, the environments get denser and denser. So what you see is a correlation of density of your sensors and the improvement in the radio technology, essentially taking you much closer to the center, center of your circle uh, than what you were in previous generations. And this is not something that is gonna stop here. As more and more tech advances, you're gonna see this essentially almost letting you know where exactly you are standing uh, inside an indoor building or in any indoor campus. Now, when we look at use cases, right? Now you saw the accuracy, you saw the tax tech, you saw the uh, element of, of history of location. The, when it comes down to the application of, of some of these location, we are always you know, worried about the accuracy. We are always looking at how accurate can I get, uh, you know, instead of wondering uh, what is my application need, right? So it does not matter how accurate you do get with the location technology. What really matters is this accuracy is actually determined by your application need. If I'm simply looking at a footfall counter, am I worried about a sub one meter accuracy and do I need to really spend uh, thousands and thousands of dollars in looking at a tech stack uh, you know, which predicts a sub one meter accuracy? So I think we need to ensure that we have the ability to very cleanly identify and quantify what our applications needs are. And that essentially will lead to uh, determining what technology stack and what level of accuracy do you really need. We, I, I, I've, I've worked with many of our customers who are generally accuracy as the starting point. Um, and, and my sincere advice is that, you know, the starting point is not accuracy. It is essentially what your application needs are. If I'm looking at inventory tracking, um, uh, you know, or inventory location within a retail chain, I do need to look at a corresponding tech stack. If I'm just looking at people counter in my building, I do need to look at uh, a subsequently different stack and, 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 and you know, the trade-offs thereof. So when we look at some of the applications of the location technology, uh, you know, if you look at the accuracy level at being at the neighborhood, you're talking about you know, hyper-targeted ads in social media, right? So when you log in today on Facebook or on Twitter, you would see that based on your location, based on the area that you have kind of specified on your profile, based on your past social posts and, and, and the various algorithms that these social media giants uh, run on the background, they would be able to target you for using a hyper-local uh, you know, ad, ad, advertisement. Uh, similarly, uh, most of our travel corporations, uh, they use elements of, of neighborhood uh, location tracking for their fleet management, for their fleet monitoring. Uh, you know, Uber is a classic example. TCI is another classic example. And, and, and look, look at the fact that these are all low fidelity requirements. They don't need to really know which, uh, you know, which building you are in front of. You know, they just need to know what neighborhood at the moment that you are kind of around, right? Then comes navigation, which uses a little bit of a high fidelity application there, uses GPS, AGPS to kind of help you drive around, uh, you know, find your way inside the city, inside the neighborhood. Um, 
when it comes to the use cases that are offered inside buildings and campuses, you know, you're talking about attendance or you're talking about time tracking, you're talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, footfall counting, uh, you're talking about uh, elements related to emergency evacuation in the sense, how many people are left still continuing continue to be inside the building during an emergency situation. When you start moving closer and closer to the center of that circle, you start looking at zonal analytics. Here you're talking about, uh, you know, in a, in a shared space environment, what's my occupancy like, right? How many people are, for example, using a specific room, um, uh, you know, in a day, how many people rotate uh, use, uh, utilizing that room? What's, what's the utilization statistics of a individual office space? You're, you're looking at lone worker monitoring, right? These are very, very useful in uh, remote locations, useful in hospitality, where you have housekeeping staff, uh, you know, that are at risk um, uh, because they do not understand or do not know who the guests that have checked in. So monitoring their safety becomes of paramount importance. Uh, and you know how much time are they spending inside the room? And uh, you know, in in the current situation, it's applicable from the perspective of has the room been deep cleaned or not. So you would like to know if the house housekeeping staff is inside the room and how much time did they spend cleaning that particular room so that you can now you know open it up for another room night. Uh, similarly, you use zone level monitoring for um, uh, you know shopper sh shopper behavior in store, uh, in malls, um, uh, you know in 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 retail chains, for example. You even do in um, uh, you know airports for that matter. As large as as most of the venues start to incorporate certain elements of retail, you would start to look at behave, measuring the behavior of people in those retail spaces because it's no longer efficient to just, just essentially charge a rent based on the square foot, you are now uh, looking at more and more location data adding up to that value of the rent of that particular location. You also want to use some of these elements to start hyper, -look, uh, you know, hyper targeting of ads. A simple use case I recall, you know, early in the, and, and this was way before, right? I mean, this particular company started to use Bluetooth as it was introduced uh, in Bangalore to start targeting people that were walking in a in a in a, in a, in, a, in a commercial environment uh, for for you know for example a street that is very very popular for uh, for selling uh, you know uh, different types of uh, retail goods so as soon as i walk into the street i would get a welcome message and as i'm in front of a store for let's take a footwear right i would actually essentially get pushed a footwear coupon uh, while i was standing in front of the store so now you had uh, people charging rents uh, based on an add-on parameter of how easy it is for you to engage with your customers while they are in your store or while they are in the vicinity of your store. Um, then comes the use cases of uh, you know points of interest, right? You typically see this on Google Maps as well, where you want to you know turn on a layer where you you know let's say you are looking for a gas station, so a gas station being your point of interest within environments inside the building too. You have points of interest, right? How many times, um, you know, have we gone to a mall and we are stuck on a particular level, trying to determine where we want to be or where, you know, hypothetically, uh, you know, where the restrooms are. I mean, there, there are so many times that we've been to malls not knowing how far the nearest restroom is, uh, and and that being a, a, a critical point of interest for that matter. With um, in the current situation with the pandemic out around, right, it is also very, very critical to use this level of location to determine the distance between two people and, and monitoring that distance so that you could be compliant to the stack, um, uh, you know, to, to, to the government bodies when you start to open up your indoor environments. You could be a retail chain, you could be an office workspace, you could be a stadium for that matter, you could be a cinema. Uh, you know, it becomes critically important to comply with some of the newer standards of, um, uh, you know, that that, ha that are applicable as a result of the current uh, <clears throat> current pandemic. And then, uh, you know, when we zoom in further, we now start to look at uh, what what we refer to as ultra precise location. Now, these are used extensively in in manufacturing, uh, in supply chain, um, uh, you know, in warehousing, and and so on. These are the places where you want to know the exact 
location of of your inventory and as the presentation goes you will you 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 start looking at some of these use cases and and the uses of uh, the ultra precise location one being obviously um, as more and more um, uh, vehicles inside a warehouse become autonomous it is it is highly critical to understand their movement to understand the safety of uh, both material and people around these articles and and the performance of these vehicles in in terms of uh, let's say you know reduction in the overall time uh, that it takes to identify a good or, or the the total number of uh, you know man hours that are clogged by people uh, in inside the warehouses <clears throat> moving on to location lenses um, would uh, sid you want to talk about this fantastic so as as you know you have probably just experienced with, with what rishi uh, enlightened us with there are so many elements and facets in the location tracking value chain and so to be able to uh, declutter this it, it makes sense to analyze it from different lenses with a framework uh, and at the front and center of the framework should be the uh, application domain lens or the use case lens which is most important from a commercial standpoint this should be the guiding principle for any location uh, you know tracking use case or location tracking uh, discussion that is to ensue then there is an environment lens which we covered around geography of it whether it is an outdoor location or whether it is an indoor location environment similarly are we for for this particular application with this particular environment does it make sense to use a visual positioning system a gps system an rfid system uh, you know a, a ble system or a combination of different technologies on top of this technologies are we then using the cell of origin technique the dead reckoning technique laceration angle based or a fingerprinting technique and this will essentially help us also narrow down to the positional quality or accuracy or reliability of tracking whether at a neighborhood level a room level or or a zonal level as rishi mentioned or at a pinpoint ultra precise level on top of that there are other considerations in place uh, with regards to the technology stack do we go with a distributed architecture or a client server architecture in the case of consumer applications or use cases like uh, rishi mentioned it would probably make more sense to go with a distributed architecture like google maps is but but with a location tracking use case which uh, wants to be able to track or monitor fleet of a transportation company it probably makes more sense from a data security angle to go with a client server architecture now on top of this if this is a location based service which is offered to an end user what is the user interface for for you know the end user to be able to experience this is it an iphone is it a car tablet like tesla or for that matter is it an ar interface or 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 for accessibility is it a tactile interface for assisting uh, 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 you know people with disabilities or for that matter in the future it could be very well a voice based interface like siri Uh, or for that matter a combination of different uh, ones now all of this makes a lot of sense but but from a context of the user how does this location data or how can this location data be used to enhance the experience even further like rishi mentioned and he'll be uh, deep diving into this further uh, what is the profile or the preference of the user what is their surroundings what is their device what is their network how does all of this affect the value proposition of the user are critical questions that need to be uh, discussed and addressed and last but not not the least what are the ethical social and legal parameters that need to be considered while building location based services this has uh, assumed a lot of importance over the last 5 years and we'll be covering this towards the end of the presentation as well now each lens while while being mutually exclusive of the other need to be looked at in conjunction with all the other lenses uh, to be effective in your approach whether you're a manufacturing company building a use case for tracking inventory or a social media network wanting to use hyper targeted location based ads or for that matter an entrepreneur building a location based service business so with this i'll i'll we'll quick start the location data uh, rishi uh, you want to take this yeah sure so we we just kind of uh, went through various aspects of location we went through the history we went through the science or the physics behind it uh, we looked at the geography lo we looked at the use cases um, we looked at use cases and accuracy uh, and and you know the aspect of what are the different lenses that you need uh, to plan 
uh, or to strategize your location based offering uh, with with that in mind you know the next element is um, or the next set of uh, topics that we want to cover is all about location analytics now one on one side are your use cases on the other side is the data that is going to get generated out of these use cases and uh, we all know i mean this has become a cliched element that you know data is the next oil and and you know everybody seems to be investing heavily on 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 the analytics what has always been missing is the element of this this location data so as we go forward you know i want to flash this uh, set of new age companies you know when we look at uh, amazon in retail when we look at coursera for education when we look at tesla in manufacturing or uber for transportation we work uh, you know we work for capital enterprise or or uh, you know workspaces um what do you think is truly common between all these new age companies <clears throat> you know what we have seen is is that these companies they use the data of the behavior of their customers right and not just customers the behavior of the things as well for example uh, you know we spoke about autonomous vehicles inside warehouse that is generating a whole bunch of data right and if you take that data and you analyze it you get insights with those insights you actually can create a complete completely differentiated offering that can can be your strategic uh, advantage into the market right so one of the things that all of these companies have done effectively um, you know is is the using of data and the uh, analytics around the data the key is that almost all your location has another entity of this data that is getting generated right if you are a re offline retailer uh, you know or a physical space retailer or or a workspace environment uh, or you are a hotel or you are a uh, you know warehouse you already have enough data that is getting generated from your core enterprise systems but what you are missing out is tapping into your location data if you have a wireless network that is rolled out inside your physical space each of these networks is emitting billions and billions of data points that analyze and 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 create or correlate with your enterprise systems to identify a completely newer insight that you were previously not um, uh, you know privy to so the 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 whole element is to not ignore this piece and to look at this piece and and see how uh, you know how this particular missing lego uh, you know lego piece if you want to call it is going to add value to your um, uh, you know your business let's take an example of um, you know a retail purchase um, uh, that i am planning to make right now that that when i'm looking at an offline store for this particular uh, online store rather like uh, for this particular um, purchase and and i'm looking at grooming kit right all i need to do is i go to amazon.in i type men's grooming kit and and pretty much everything shows up uh, at this point in time amazon already knows my identity um, you know having uh, you know having asked me to authenticate to the website it already knows my geography uh, because it knows where i need to deliver this uh, this particular um, element uh, it also knows a whole element uh, you know whole aspect of my behavior on the website through the site analytics now this could be google analytics or any uh, omniture or any any specific tools that that you've been using for your site analytics right um uh, as soon as I, I i kind of do this search uh, either they already realize the element of my past purchase that i have made and and a, a, a recommendation is already kind of available to me so that i can do a one click purchase of of whatever recommendation was available or it allows me to kind of uh, uh, you know compare this particular uh, online item with a plethora of other available options and kind of give me the flexibility to choose or select the best among among it right so in essence they know the identity they know what i have done on the site in the past they know what my ba typical basket size has been and and they use all of these pieces of data to truly provide a very differentiated experience uh, it could be a simple one click checkout uh, you know i don't need to enter the credit card i don't need to enter my my home location it's just select the product and and boom you are done right now compare this experience uh with 
something of an offline journey uh, to your neighborhood uh, store, right? The first thing is you walk into the store, your identity is completely unknown. Nobody at the store knows, right? Nobody at the store knows what your past purchases have been. Uh, your your behavior in the store, for example, that you uh, you know between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, you typically shop for groceries, or uh, you know uh, you are a, uh, you know you you typically buy lunch at this particular restaurant. All of those elements of those behaviors have never been captured in the past, right? Um, in this particular case, because we wanted to browse for shaving blades, uh, you know I have no idea where in a large uh, store these blades are located. So I walk in, the first thing is anxiety to search and find the exact thing that I'm looking for. Um, there's no way to uh, you know, find out in one click you know, where this particular inventory is. At the same time, there is also no way to find out how this inventory compares to a bunch of others that are just right next to it. So you are now busy finding that uh, location of where this inventory is, and you are also trying to figure out whether to buy uh, blade A versus blade B and, and what are the technical specs or elements around you know, uh, buying these things. Finally, when you've made your decision and you walk towards the checkout counter uh, and, and you present either your loyalty card or your credit card uh, you know, to make the purchase, that's the point in time when you truly reveal your identity to the store, right? And, and then the store realizes, oh, you are a loyal member. And the store realizes you have a platinum card and the store realizes that your typical basket size has always been thousand bucks for you know for uh, you know thousand bucks every two days therefore you know you need to get that differentiated experience it is already too late to offer you that differentiated experience at, at checkout and and this kind of uh, you know um, makes you wonder whether to choose uh, you know choose store a versus store b and of course, there are other external factors that determine this, but the, the bottom line that I'm trying to say is when you look at an online experience and an offline, it is not comparable. And, and this is where you see a bunch of decline, decline happening in physical spaces, whether it is retail, whether it is hospitality, right? Uh, whether it is um, uh, you know, carpeted enterprises and so on. What I want to now kind of you know, talk about is what if you add this location data to that offline business, to that physical business, right? And, and if we now do a one is to one comparison between the two, right? Um, and, and for this, I'm assuming that the store is offering some kind of a Wi-Fi program and that your device is connected to this Wi-Fi, right? For simplicity purpose. There are of course challenges in making sure that people connect to Wi-Fi, but we'll talk about that uh, you know, on, on a different day. Uh, the, you know, assuming that a device that you are having is connected to the store Wi-Fi, you, when you walk in, now at this point in time, as you are connecting your device, your identity is known to the store. So you are first solving that identity blank. You have solved that piece with this, with this approach, right? Your identity is now known to the network. If it's known to the network, it will now get known to another system in the network, another enterprise application in the network. You can then use this signal to trigger, for example, a push notification to a store associate, right? You can say, hey, Sid just walks, walk, walked into the store. He's a platinum member. He, he visits the store once, uh, you know, three times in a week. Um, um, uh, his typical basket size is 800 rupees onwards or upwards, right? So now the store associate knows exactly what your loyalty status is, what your past purchases are, and he has the ability now to provide a service that is based on some of these data points, right? Your behavioral data is also known. How many times have you come in the past? What, you know, um, uh, you know, what are your zone preferences? By that, what I mean is, are you typically a grocery buyer? Are you typically a, 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 you know, a, a food court user? Are you typically a, a, a person who just uh, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a window shopper for that matter, right? So these, these behavioral patterns are already available. And these behavioral patterns can now be superset um, uh, you know uh, or rather superimposed on some of your other enterprise applications to make that browsing experience a lot more elevated right so imagine this new age physical store i walk in there is a store associate who gets the message that you know uh, a platinum member has just walked in he gets the picture of the platinum member 
and the location of where that platinum member is in the store. Uh, he can be intrusive, non-intrusive, right? Can wish you good morning, good afternoon, or whatever that is. And as soon as I cross the aisle of my most purchased product, right, I get a push notification that says, hey, you know what? Here's $20 off on your uh, total basket size of, of $100 and beyond, right? Now, that coupon is far, the probability of that coupon being redeemed is far higher than a coupon that you receive in an email on, on a weekday, which is not typically the day when you go to the store, right? So now you look at how the, how the browsing experience in your physical store itself is elevated. Now, if you have an online checkout facility, I could actually be in the physical store, but still check out online, right? So you are now able to offer an online offline checkout experience. And the whole element of this entire journey is also captured and recorded for additional analytics in the future and additional differential services that you can offer in, in, in the future, right? So how is all of this possible? It is possible through location data. Now, in a theoretical sense, location data is any data that is processed as a result of uh, the individual device's communication in a network or on a network, right? And that network being able to determine the geographical position of the device or the user, right? And, and this geographical position in, in, in old school is the latitude, longitude, uh, you know, in an airline, it's the altitude. In an indoor, it is the X, Y, Z coordinate of where this particular device is. This, this location data can also um, comprise of the direction that I'm, I'm walking towards, right? So for example, in, in, in your navigation systems, they, the location data always tells you which is true north so that you are able to kind of determine. It knows which direction you are going in so it can offer or recommend the best possible route and the, uh, you know, that, that you need to take uh, to reach your destination. This location data can also include the time uh, of, of, of the recording uh, of that location information. So whether it is morning, evening, afternoon, what, what, at what specific time of the day were you connected to the network? When you look at all these three elements, right? And, and you now add these elements to some of your other business data assets. Um, you basically get uh, what we call as, um, uh, you know, a mishmash of location analytics with enterprise analytics, right? Or, 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 or your typical um, uh, big data uh, from, from the, the location side of the world. Mm -hmm. So having understood, uh, you know, uh, location data, having understood a bit about location analytics, you know what are the you know what are the key insights that this location data can can kind of uh, drive or can can actually deliver and i'm going to use the retail example because retail has been the forefront has been in the forefront of adopting the location tech stack right they have been using it uh, they have been mishmashing the location data own analytics and, and, and their own uh, enterprise data and they have been offer they have they've actually been offering differentiated experience to their customers um, uh, you know, for, for some time now. Um, so the first set of, of analytics or insights that you could get from the location data are basically uh, time and frequency KPIs, right? Um, you would also basically get um, uh, some kind of an insight in terms of whether the size of the store has any impact on the frequency. Uh, you know, things like airports, uh, you know, this is not relevant, but a retail store, it is very, very relevant. As I buy more, as, I, as my store keeps growing bigger and bigger, as it does continues continues to do that, has there been any impact on people coming back? You know, you typically go to a mall, you will realize that some of the retail chains, the modern ones, start really big. And then six months later, you suddenly see that they have become half the size, right? How do they basically decide on, on those elements? And, and, and that, that piece is, is largely determined by, by the location insights and location data, right? You could use location data to correlate the time spent with loyalty index, right? So you arrive at a number that says that, you know, people that spent more than 30 minutes at my store are, are far more loyal to me and their basket size is far more larger than those who spent less than 30 minutes at my store. And, and, and you could do a lot, lot of such insights as, as you start to look at this data being mashed up with some of your other enterprise applications. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Sid, you want to take over the, the, the manufacturing example? Mm -hmm. So 
in in uh, as you know rishi uh, uh, spoke at length about how location data can play a huge role in the retail value chain uh, i'd like to uh, share some of my experience of uh, how manufacturing can, uh, how how location can play a huge role in the industrial space in the manufacturing or the warehousing side of things uh, so in my in my previous role i scrutinized operations at you know more than 30 factories and warehouses across different sectors to optimize supply chain spends and so with this i i'd like you to imagine you know a huge factory or a warehouse where you would have more than 4000 to 5000 boxes uh, all strewn around in an area the size of a football stadium uh, and you would have more than 200 300 odd workers who are trying to you know individually spot one box after the other because they need to be shipped to the customer location immediately but but about 100 to 150 of these boxes are not going to be where they're supposed to be uh so as a result of that sometimes it would take hours for those workers to be able to find just one box because they are doing it through brute force and every 10 minutes of a delay spent every shift looking for a misplaced box costs the organization half a million dollars annually this is a huge amount of money and there's an add on impact to it in terms of missed customer deliveries huge employee productivity losses in first trying to keep it at the wrong location and then trying to inefficiently find it again and if that box happens to contain raw material components for a discrete manufacturer where which operate on just in time principles then the losses for due to uh, you know possible production disruptions are going to be even more monumental so with this uh, you know in, uh, uh, what 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 With, with this what what location data can do is to help minimize all of such instances with ultra precise location tracking technology imagine if you can find the inventory that you want to look for in a matter of seconds just like you would do in the case of google maps where you simply type in the coordinates that you want to reach out to this can help reduce the stock search time as well as significantly improve the throughput of the organization moreover with with location tracking you can also improve the productivity and efficiency of the equipment fleet that are operating in the premises so you can improve and rationalize the number of fleet that is operating thereby improving the opex cost, uh, the operating expenditure of the organization as well as with real time location and telemetry information you can help minimize the safety incidents which cost uh, you know about 100 million dollars in us alone because of such accidents happening moreover with Uh, a, a lot of such uh, industrial facilities operating a huge amount of workers having real time visibility on the productivity and efficiency of the workers can help improve their efficiency help reduce the organization save costs and moreover with the wake of covid you can also improve the safety of the organization with real time social distancing monitoring and contact tracing enablement so that you don't need to shut down the entire facility should there god forbid be a symptomatic or a positive case in the facility and so with this the goal or the road map of of leveraging data in a manufacturing setup uh, is is humongous or uh, where where it first starts with a sensor network that is deployed to help you know create or or capture this digital information about the physical material flow and and so with this there's there's another layer which helps you to capture this and visualize all this information and create a digital twin but the larger opportunity lies when all of this data is integrated and federated with all the existing systems in the facility be it the ERP the MRP the MES the WMS which can further result in even more automation processes for for improvement in the planning process improvement in the overall capital expenditure that needs to be deployed and improvement in the operating expenditure and that is why uh, 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 even according to mckinsey and all the other reports out there location data and iot data has the most amount of scope to uh, extract more value for the organization in the manufacturing and the warehousing sector so one of the other aspect of uh, uh, you know the the challenges in 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 large scale adoption of ultra precise location technology is the existence of um, uh, you know multiple players um, uh, you know multiple tech stacks uh, and and uh, uh, a lack of an integrated approach to some of these uh, pieces and what i mean by that is at your location you would be using wireless 
for a specific set of location uh, tech stack. You'd be using BLE with an over, overlay network for another set of uh, uh, you know, location accuracy and, and, and use cases. You would be using uh, UWB for a completely different set of, of uh, uh, you know, indoor accuracy of, of the use case that you want to achieve, leading to multiple dashboards, leading to multiple management tools, uh, you know, and, and leading to different workforce uh, with a differentiated experience, one, one being experience towards your network, another person being more experienced towards, you know, your tags and, and so on. And then comes the piece of, you know, uh, troubleshooting when there is an issue that happens, right? Is it a problem with the tag manufacturer? Is it a problem with the actual physical tag? Um, is it a problem with the overlay network? Is it a problem with the wireless network? Is it a, is it a, you know, is it a local problem itself, right? You know, there could be a, a, a whole bunch of, um, uh, you know, radio frequencies that are crisscrossing because of, of different tax stacks operating within your indoor uh, location. And, and you are unable to now accurately troubleshoot some of these elements. And a lot of these, um, uh, you know, causes uh, an impact on whether I want to really cross that bridge of adopting this aspect of, of ultra precise location or not. You know, with, this, with the advent of GDPR, people started really looking at location, uh, at, at user privacy and, and security in a much more organized fashion. In fact, I'm reminded of an incident in 2010 when smartphones had just come in and Wi-Fi was starting to, you know, get hugely adopted in commercial establishments everywhere. Uh, and, and there were companies that were coming up that were just starting to use RSSI signals to be able to track uh, users as well. At that point in time, people were able to directly track the users through their MAC addresses without having any consent of the user whatsoever. And this incident came to the fore while many companies were doing this. A US senator took a motion against one company and shut it down. Uh, it then took about seven to eight more years to, uh, for people to start taking privacy very seriously because after GDPR, Apple and Google started introducing more and more security protocols around uh, uh, disallowing third party apps to use this information for their own benefits without the user consent. Uh, Facebook, for that matter, has been you know, uh, in, in the news most of the times. And the reason for that is if I'm a business owner that makes, say, purple shoelaces and I want to target single females aged between 25 and 35 who live in Richmond Road, who went to college, who make, you know, 10 lakh rupees a year and who love shoelaces and who regularly purchase those products. Guess what? Facebook has all of that information and brands pay top dollars to be able to get access to that precise uh, 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 set of information about those people so that they know that on targeting them, they will buy their products. Now, all of this data is actually captured by a lot of such applications uh, like Facebook, Google, etc., who calculate your location data based on GPS, cellular signals, Wi-Fi, cell of origin techniques, and whatnot. And so this needs to be looked at very clearly uh, right now. Uh, and, and in fact, a, another example of how this, this has uh, uh, been abused to a certain extent is the mass surveillance that, that is being used in China for, on its people, where, where CCTV cameras around the world are leveraging AI algorithms and neural networks to be able to track people their movements without any, uh, you know, uh, supervision or whether any uh, uh, ombudsman whatsoever. And, and so our advice to, to uh, ma uh, our advice to businesses as well as entrepreneurs wanting to uh, do something in location would also be to give a huge amount of importance to the social, legal and ethical aspects of this as well, because privacy is here to stay and it is an evolving subject. As people get more and more aware about it, privacy laws and regulations are going to get strengthened. And we are awaiting the data privacy law uh, in India very soon. So with that, we'll, we'll uh, 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 take a wrap. Rishi? Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being there as a part of the masterclass with me and Sid. And um, we hope that as a takeaway, you are now empowered and capable to start your journey, um, understand the lenses that are required to adopt uh, a location tech, uh, tech within your um, uh, indoor locations and take uh, your businesses to a level uh, by using the location data and superimposing with your own enterprise data sets. So thanks again and, and um, we are open for questions.